one of the stories that is more commonly known about the source coming down is Ray Benzino going back and forth with a flurry of disc tapes against Eminem and then the source releasing, which is now, you know, commonly referred to as the racist tapes by Eminem. Looking back, you guys releasing those racist tapes as a publication, it damaged your credibility, but it also created enemies with some of the most powerful people in hip hop. Um, If you have problems with Eminem, obviously you have problems with Dr. Dre. You have problems with Snoop Dogg, Jimmy Iovine, Interscope Records. At one point, you guys had an avalanche of problems coming down the hill at you. Do you look at this and say to yourself, well, if this was today, I would do things different. Maybe I would give those tapes to another publication because Benzino being a partner in the most credible publication representing hip hop and an artist going back and forth with another artist, that's just a conflict of interest by itself. And then to release those tapes, now you're making enemies out of some of the biggest names in hip hop. So it puts everything that you work for in the source in jeopardy. Would you make that same decision now? Yeah, well, first of all, like you said, this is something that may be more popularly known and talked about through the media over the years, as opposed to the stuff I just broke down that was all real and was all much more of a factor. The fact of the matter is, yeah, Interscope pulled all their advertising, but in those years, record company advertising was a fraction of our revenue. You know, in the early days, it was all our revenue, but by then, you know, we had Ford and McDonald's and Coca-Cola. We had everybody advertising in the source in, in 2000s. So Interscope pulling out their advertising didn't have any impact on the company financially. And that's a story that's been pushed, a narrative that's been pushed when that whole thing unfolded, you know. Um, so I want to clear that up first. Um, so, you know, I never felt like financially it was going to be an issue. Um, you know, I think with the m M&M situation, um, it started because Benzino felt when, when the movie 8 Mile came out. And, and let me back up and say this. The source discovered Eminem, okay? The source had Eminem in unsigned height. Eminem is the first white person ever on the cover of the source. Um, Eminem wins Lyricist of the Year at the Source Awards in 99 over some heavy competition. You know, we helped launch Eminem's career and we supported Eminem for those first few years. But by 2002, I think, is when 8 Mile is coming out. And this is when the media goes into kind of overdrive, the mainstream media. And it's like, you know, Eminem is the king of hip hop. You know, he's the greatest to ever do it. You know, they're just, you know, going crazy with, you know, the way they're portraying him. And I think that, you know, rub Benzino the wrong way. And I think it had him thinking like, you know, this could be bad for hip hop, you know, that that just like Elvis was used to change the trajectory of rock and roll music and cut out black folks, you know, you know, and then you're seeing at remember again what I was just talking about, all these black owned companies being targeted and wiped out. You know, these are companies, these Rough Riders, these Rockefellers, these uh, no limits and cash monies, they they got, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of employees that they have on payroll, guys, you know, many of whom just got home from jail and didn't have, wouldn't have gotten a job anywhere else. I mean, they were really impacting people's lives and communities and families that have been dealing with, you know, generational poverty forever. 
And these black companies that were flourishing in the late 90s, you know, did a lot to begin to, to try to turn some of that around. But you look, you blink, and by 2004, they're gone. If they exist, they're just an imprint where you have one person up at Interscope that's in charge of bad boy or whatever, but there's no big offices and 50 people on staff anymore, any of that stuff, all that gets wiped out. And again, that's partly from the FBI, that's partly the music industry kind of using the, 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 the internet and its impact on sales as a, as a kind of excuse or rationale to wipe these, these, these companies out, et cetera. Um, so we're in the midst of, of, of all that. And then this Eminem thing is going crazy. So I think it just got, it, it, he saw that and he just felt like this is bad. And he made like a, a diss on a mixtape, a little eight line diss, nothing on a mixtape that hardly went out anywhere. In a matter of weeks after the mixtape got put out, we start getting phone calls. Eminem's in the studio. He's already made three records dissing the source and dissing Dave and dissing Benzino and, you know, they're going crazy, whatever. And, you know, what I will say is I think, you know, it, it became personal and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't meant to be personal. The issue was not about Eminem per se at the time, because when it starts, those racist tapes don't exist. Nobody knows about those. We don't know about them. Nobody knows about those. Those only surface a year down the line after the back and forth, you know, Eminem comes out with songs dissing the source, Benzino makes songs and videos dissing Eminem and going back and forth and, you know, and the magazine kind of, you know, reports on this stuff and, and you know, probably, you know, obviously took our side. Um, so I think it getting personal wasn't the right way to handle it. Um, at least through the pages of the magazine, but I always felt like, you know, we weren't, we were doing this for other reasons. Like we were trying to get a point about other things that ended up, you know, kind of getting lost. And then a year down the line, you know, these three white kids from Detroit drive from Detroit and show up in, in my lobby. And they're sitting out there for a couple hours, you know, and waiting to try to get to see me. And finally I get the message and I, I bring them in and and they play me some of this music, the the racist rap hour, you know, that, that Eminem and his group at the time, you know, his three other white guys had made this whole tape with a lot of racist stuff on it. And, you know, of course that was that was shocking to hear. Um and um so I mean at that point, you know, we had an obligation to, you know, as a as a magazine as a journalistic, you know, entity to report about that and, and, and put it out there. Um, and, uh, you know, there was some negotiations behind the scenes with Interscope trying to, trying to shut it down and trying to get us not to put them out and bury them so nobody would, would know about it. But, you know, those didn't go anywhere. And, 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 and we published uh, the information. They sued us to try to stop us from putting it out. Uh, in federal court, and we won a landmark copyright uh, ruling where the judge uh, allowed us to put out only a very small portion uh, of the tape um, under what's called fair use law. But, um, you know, so a lot of the stuff that was on that tape never got out um, and so on. So, you know, in, in retrospect, I think it got personal and I shouldn't have allowed the magazine to at least give an appearance of, of taking, you know, a personal kind of agenda. This is the thing that I was talking about earlier that, that I didn't like that was happening at the source years before. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Benzino obviously was angry as, as the disses and things, you know, he took it very personally and, and, you know, so, things got a little, a little bit crazy. And, uh, yeah, I wish it, I wish it hadn't gone that way. 